Good evening. What's a book? Who says so? Maybe Lars Mueller. In an era of publisher equivocation and internet advancement, in a time when prognosticators insist a book is an antique, Lars arrives to argue the contrary. Not the book in retreat, but the book on attack. There is often a sense that unpublished content exists ipso facto, and the act of publishing simply ratifies in print what somehow exists a priori as concept. Not so. Book conception makes the abstract tangible. Without the book, the content remains only a perpetual possibility. Lars is a book architect, not book architecture as a gen as a not book architecture as a generic proposition, a la Rizzoli or Thames and Hudson or Farrar Strauss. Rather, the Mueller book project is publication one book at a time. Building Building necessitates a form language. Ditto the Lars book, which continues to re-examine the meanings of size, shape, color, graphics, and text. What makes a book and what makes a book matter? The print medium typically delivers a standardized book project abetted by wood blocks or movable type or laser ink jet or offset digital processes. For most tiptoeing publishers, the pro forma is tradition bound. The Lars pro forma interrogates that tradition. Let's find out one volume at a time, he says. Always the next book, never the final book. If Plato's cave gave us the form of the book form as a question, each Mueller book gives Plato a different response. Ulysses, first edition, 1934. The graphic form ratifies Joyce's private linguistics. So you thought an English sentence required a capital letter, a noun, a verb, and a period. Maybe not. Next one. E. E. Cummings poem, bracket, L, parenthesis, A, bracket, 1958. I want you to read this. Read the poem. You know the poem? You assumed a conventional line-by-line -line alignment of text was the poet's form? Maybe not. See if you can read this. A leaf falls. A leaf falls. Loneliness. If you find the leaf, the loneliness finds you. The print form inspires the search. Lars' teachers are James Joyce and E.E. E. Cummings. Never simply what's on the page but what's a page? Please welcome Lars Mueller to SciArc. I have prepared a kind of an overture out of uh, our analog sound archive. So, to remind us, um, well, I've written some thoughts because English is still not my 
first language. Um, when 30 years ago I decided to become a book publisher, the world was still analog and the book was an esteemed cultural product that could be had for a price that reflected its verse. For graphic designers like me, the book took its place alongside the poster and the album cover as one of the supreme disciplines of the trade. Electronic computers were rare except for the odd IBM PC or Apple II in some offices or sometimes a Commodore 64 as a toy. That is until the Macintosh 128K came along with its newfangled display and mouse showing where the future was going. Up to the early 90s, memory was limited or very expensive and systems were unreliable. A bomb signaled a system crash and was the most love-hated icon of the time. As naive, as charming as that might seem today. When in the mid-90s, the internet and the World Wide Web gradually attracted wider attention, it seemed like a promise of great things to come. I still remember my first email to a friend in Seattle saying, I am getting closer. In the past 20 years, the digital revolution has utterly transformed the way we live and has created new commercial and aesthetic value systems. But please, don't look at me tonight as a long-suffering publisher. Think of me instead as a pensive teacher and designer, or just as a plain old citizen. I find myself at the beginning of a journey that will take me from California to Brazil, and from there to Tokyo, then back to Switzerland via Bombay. I will give this lecture in those places and adjust my examples, comparisons and suppositions to the particular givens as far as my knowledge and experience will allow. Even if the various countries I'll be visiting are in different stages of development, my thesis remains the same. Relatively speaking, we are still dilettants in the way that we deal with the new tools and instruments, while at the same time we have lost control over our analog reality. I would like to explain this. I'm not speaking for all, but for many of us. And I'm speaking from a position that is beyond suspicion. Since I'm a, I am a book publisher, you will acknowledge that I will not surrender my belief in the lasting significance of my medium in exchange for what, in the annals of history, may be a slight bit of excitement. Even though I will admit to being an enthusiastic user of those digital tools that make life easier. It seems that we are about to face a stage of potential consolidation, the perfect, perfecting and global use of digital systems. New areas of application and new devices are not in sight, at least not the kinds that would interest us as designers. We don't need to bother with the talking refrigerator. In contrast to the assumption made in naive euphoria, for many people, the revelation of the digital paradigm does not mean freedom, but constraint or coercion. Coercion, sorry. The alleged democratization of knowledge and unlimited access to its superficialities do not strengthen the individual. On the contrary, they weaken him, because in the end, everyone winds up knowing very little of the same. The goodies that lured us have allowed us to overlook the fact that the goal of the strategy is not individual welfare. Instead, the aim is to obtain knowledge of and control over our behavior. With the help of digital lures, we are all toggled into line. It may be that you are less disturbed by this than I. 
and that you see in me the paranoid European. I will not try to defend myself, but I would like to draw your attention to a few salient aspects. Our disciplines, architecture and design, produce a disproportionate number of victims within the context I have described. Our activities as creators are traditionally founded in individuality, stubbornness and obsession. Not being equal, but being unique. The isms and dogmas that have prevailed from the 20th century to today have proved that only the innovators are the winners, the followers are the losers. In these days of digital equalization, it is difficult, though not impossible, for an architect or designer to develop the personality necessary, necessary for the job. This personality is a requirement for any kind of success in our métier. Without it, we are slaves to our profession. What can be done? Considering the relative quiet on the technology front, we could reorganize our priorities. Which tools would I like to master to perf perfection and for what purposes? What other tools would I like to become familiar with and make use of with the help of specialists? How do I distinguish my communications and set myself apart from the poverty of social media? How am I different from others? What makes me, me? and why am I unique? Become your own touchstone. Make your own standards. Analog perception is direct and continuous. Analog experience is authentic, systemic, and real. We have the chance, not to mention the privilege, to create a balance between our natural dealings with digital content and our sphere of authentic events and experience. That is the part of our real life that is unique and unmistakable. It is the reservoir for our imagination, our visions. It provides the ammunition for our ideas. What is real? Confronting heritage, history and development. Individuality is a given. It cannot be won, but it can be lost. Living authentically means, for example, to keep or demand control over one's individual and suggested needs. Our state of mind about this can be easily seen in our behavior towards food and the environment, our susceptibility to trends and fashion. That's authenticity. All right. So, uh, recognizing social, technological, cosmic coherences. Feeling small but be part of a whole. Systems resemble each other. Analog systems are the key to understanding complex structures that, when digitally controlled, remain hidden to us. Thinking in terms of systems means recognizing the abilities, relationships, and contexts that are not immediately obvious. Looking behind the curtain, being aware of, correcting, and determining one's own position in the system. System-based thought does not make the world any better, but it is an approach towards perceiving oneself outside of me and we. And we. Preserve, effectuate, change. Feel like an, like an individual, but act like a citizen. Finally, political action is the consequence of the awareness of reality within an in individual who lives authentically and thinks in terms of systems. Every action requires a reaction. Out of this grows the political, or to put it another way, the social, cultural, economic, and ecological responsibility of the actor. 
As architects and designers, we are actors. We act in the names of others. We create the world. We develop it. What gives us the right to do that, if not better knowledge? Back to the analog. Acquiring analog experience is relatively simple and fun at the same time. It happens always, and it always happens in real time. Perceiving it is a cognitive effort. Listen to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, for instance. It is about 70 minutes long. Think about the conductor and about the musicians and about the composer who spent 10 years working on it. The specific density of thought, the absolute ambition is the benchmark. Jackson Pollock spent an afternoon covering a canvas in dribble and producing an icon of abstract expressionism. Creation always happened in real time. More practical analog experience can be had when you invite friends for dinner, then stroll through the market, buying whatever strikes your fancy and coming up with a crazy menu. You manage to prepare everything masterfully just in time, entertaining your guests splendidly, and let the dishes sit until the next morning. That is analog. Or you read a book. From page one all the way through to the end, you turn the pages, make notes, read, nod off, dream, keep reading. The end approaches, still 20 pages left. That too is analog. Finally, the love letter. Masterpieces of poetic writing, handwritten. From out of the ink flows yearning. The handwriting betrays the writer's inner tumult. How am I supposed to pack that into a tweet? That is analog, that is authentic. And so are your architecture and your design. Passionate, full of conviction, ingenious, well-informed, unique. Some of my examples may seem trivial to you. What I'm concerned about is precisely the loss of curiosity and interest in everyday sensation. But I would not lecture you with such verve were I not also secretly trying to convince you of the merits of the book. There are imperial, uh, empirical studies that prove that a wall filled with books can make a person feel as if the room temperature is warmer than it really is. But that is none of my concern. Rather, I would like to try to persuade you that there are fundamental differences between the way that we absorb information from online research and the way we do, do it when reading or looking through a book. After all, the ob obvious expectation is that the reader will invest time and take in a vast amount of ballast in order to distill the information down to its essence. But that is precisely what it's all about. The book makes the reader think and select. The digital source of knowledge allows him to pick and choose. Each process causes a considerable difference in our brains. Encyclopedic knowledge is difficult to recall over the long term, while knowledge acquired through thought is anchored in a, ne in a nexus of associations. Whichever way you want to see it, the most crucial thing about the book is its authorship, the identity of the transmitter. Someone is responsible for selecting the information for determining sequence and structure, and he stands behind it with his name. That makes a difference. You have a counterpart which makes a dialogue possible. This aspect is central to my program, the identity of the or originator and his statements, which offer a source of friction and demands confrontation. I will give you a few examples uh, out of my uh, program. Um, so, authorship uh, amongst, so in, in, in visual language, I, I say, um, is probably 
closest to the architect's drawing. It's recognized here in a book we did three or four years ago with this beautiful title, Drawing to Find Out, which is a quote from Louis Kahn. And I was blown away kind of from this huge collection of drawings for this one, one project, which he spent five years on drawing and uh, developing, and it was never built. So the book gives almost original size drawings and explains the process of the making. We kept the analysis apart by publishing a second volume, which is more, more scholarly, more analytic. Um, interesting to me is to see that the scholarly item is sold out, while the other one still is uh, on stock. So, well, interesting because obviously there is an interest in knowing about more than in discovering yourself by, by looking at the drawings. Um, continuing that observation of uh, architects' handwriting and, uh, and proving that there are some brave and recognized practitioners out there who still believe that the shortest way from idea to image is through your hand. Su Fujimoto agreed spontaneously to hand over his sketchbook to me, which we printed in a facsimile edition. He is constantly drawing with his thin red pen, and it's somehow interesting or convincing to see that his style of drawing or his drawings really remind us or is, are closely related to his architecture, which is this kind of light, uh, transparent structures. Another candidate in my observation was Wang Shu, the Pritzker Prize winner, I think two years ago, who has a very different practice in drawing, sketching, does not carry a sketchbook. He is spending time every day uh, making calligraphies and getting closer to his master's um, size, right? I, I didn't know that before, but uh, obviously that's the aim of a calligrapher to really, with one pencil, always the one, the same uh, uh, pencil, to get his letters smaller and smaller. Um, with that passion and patience, he is also observing uh, his architecture he may spend a day on the site in sun and rain and observe and, and uh, analyze the situation, the light, the temperature, the wind. And then he starts a drawing process which is quite amazing because it's all on A3 paper in with a very thin pencil drawn and it's all in scale, and it's a developing process which I think may be, may be a, a century ago since it was practiced like this in the West. Uh, interesting enough, there was no book out on Wang Shu when he received uh, the Pritzker. So the jury had a hard time collecting articles from magazines and so on. And even after receiving the Pritzker, he refused uh, kind of to speed up and publish a monograph. And he rather preferred uh, my concept or our concept to publish the drawings first. We are still working on the monograph. It's one year delayed now, but I think time uh, is a relative 
factor in such a process. And here again, I think there is a very close relationship between the drawing and the way of building where there's a lot of traditional craft involved. Uh, also, fastly, quickly disappearing in China. And then, um, the second volume of Stephen Hall's Watercolors, actually that was the very beginning of my discovery and also this, uh, this uh, stressing the fact that probably authenticity in architecture is really staying away from whatever digital tools or softwares, at least in the process of, of creation. Um, Twelve years ago, we published the first volume of Stephen Hall's Watercolors, and there was one following last year. There are about 400 watercolors collected to show also the obsession, but also the, the artistic quality of uh, a sketching process. It was one saying, maybe I suggested, but Stephen confirmed that the drying process of the watercolor is essential for the reflection on your own idea. So you sketch, you, you draw, uh, and you color it, and while the color is drawing, uh, drying, you have some time to rethink. As a matter of fact, the books I published with uh, Stephen now over 12 years have made a kind of a family of books, uh, very rare also in my program, but also proving our friendship and also the trust of the author in his publisher and designer. Um, the manufacturing process, the kind of the binding, the, the choice of material, uh, is always a very intense dialogue um, where I really have to remain strong because you can imagine how it is to compete with an architect's ego in this process. Um, anyway, those were the first two ones and it also came along with something that is became a passion of myself is with is working into the cover of a book in different ways um, and and see it as the how to say the signature of the book or as you may say the facade of a building and um, that is something that worked out until the last issue which we celebrated uh, yesterday with uh, Stephen's lecture at the uh, Schindler House. Um, and I'm especially proud that we have this fifth, because I, I believe in unpaired numbers, so I suffered a bit after the four, so I was looking forward for, the, for number five, and it came out also with the brave initiative of uh, Christoph Kumpusch, who is here. He's happy to sign books afterwards, I believe. Um, it's, a great, it's a great book, I think. Uh, the title, Urban Hopes, and yesterday, during his lecture, um, Stephen kind of mixed up, because he should have known better what the reasons were to get the book down to that size. He made it a little bit big yesterday. He said the trip is that big and urban hopes and so. Uh, there were two reasons. One was the calculation which said that the big format would have led to costs of $85, which definitely is not in the range of a young architect's, let's say, budget. Um, and the book is not meant to fill the shelves and be unread in the shelves of dentists and lawyers. Um, rather, 
to be in the hands of students. So that's one reason. But there is another reason which I discuss, discussed with uh, Christoph. I remember that discussion very well, where I thought that Urban Hopes as a title, Urban Hopes Made in China by Stephen Hall, on a big format book would give a wrong sign. So to protect Stephen from any damage, I would say, we made the book small and much smaller, half the size. Uh, so, and um, as Eric put it yesterday, becomes a kind of a fairy tale in that format. So it's kind of humble, and it's an it's an offer. It's uh, it's not insisting on anything. So um, I'm pretty happy that we were uh, strong in that process. And yeah. So I go through a few images. Um, of course, if you if you have a design that you have to cut in half. It's like what we experienced with, with the record cover that time. You know, when the CD uh, the, came up and we had to reduce all the records, record designs, uh, sleeve designs to half, um, you really found out which were the good sleeves. And something which happened here too, and I think it works out well, it's even I think more pleasant because it's not a coffee table book anymore. It's a book you may carry with you or in in your backpack and read when you have the time to. Most of the photographs are by Ivan Bahn, who uh, you will meet uh, some more times during my presentation. He has been following Stevens architecture now for quite a while. There are some inserts in the book and one is um, dedicated to Lebeus Wood's light pavilion uh, in one of Stephen Hall's uh, structures and we actually half a year ago uh, or a year ago almost we published this book only on the light pavilion, also to memorize uh, Lebeus Wood's uh, pass away. There is a type of books where I am only partly proud of. Uh, you may imagine that as a publisher you, you get lots of requests and offers and sometimes I can't resist and I may say yes to a one building monograph which is a type of books um, which is not really supportive to the book trade or to the survival of the book I would say but I may once in a while say yes I say I'm corrupt if the, if the price is high enough um, because this book I, I love to do because I've done several books with Zaha Hadid and uh, most of them were one building monographs in fact um, and there is a certain freedom which I request and I, I get offered is that the cover is always mine you know the architects always mess up with the content but I insist the cover is mine so, and the cover really tries to interpret the building in one way or the other. And in this case, it's a huge building in Baku, Azerbaijan, which is a little bit too big, I think, for the city, but that's not the fault of the architects. That's the ego of the president of the nation. Uh, it's an amazing structure. and a beautiful inside light. The photographs were made by Ivan Bahn and Helene Binet. And I tried to arrange kind of uh, photographic essays within the book. A 
of course the construction as digital as the facade is the construction was very analog heavy but of course without the most advanced software such a structure could never be designed or built those are those are the panels on the roof i think there are i think hundreds of different uh, uh, sizes and shapes um, there was a second volume which was uh, commissioned by the the general contractor which is not available on the on the trade but which together the two books together make this kind of kind of wave or, or uh, reference to the facade you may imagine that in on a 1.5 millimeter cardboard to make a relief uh, uh, structure um, needs some power it's a, actually seven tons per square meter which is really a lot so the bookbinders uh, factory was kind of shaking when they were embossing the structure and the two go together into a, to a sleeve Um, that book was, or let's say, I got the confidence of the architects because there was a reference to another book we did uh, several years ago on the Cincinnati Art Museum by Zaha, which also had this kind of relief uh, um, impression which also reflected the facade, which had a kind of a multi-layer um, uh, sculptural appearance. So, and, and the kind of relief, also it's, it's fake here, of course, it's printed, but the, the Photoshop work was done towards this kind of impression of three-dimensionality throughout. It looks simple, but it's kind of very delicate because you really have and, and you don't want to read it on the inside, on the on the reverse side of the cardboard. So you really have to give a lot of pressure on the very hard steel on the ground to make it keep it flat. Another cover for uh, Tsa project. So um, yeah, it's fun. So for Stephen and Tsa, they are actually the two longest lasting uh, partners in bookmaking in architecture. Uh, this one for Zaha goes back to 1999, I think, when she only had two buildings built uh, in or near Basel, in, uh, Basel, Switzerland. Uh, that leads me to a short ex excursion to the relationship between the publisher and the architect. I think, um, and probably the best books come out of real partnership. It's an eye-to-eye -eye, uh, process. It's a kind of a shared uh, vision and responsibility. And I would like to say that probably the best architecture also comes out of such kind of relationships between the client and the architect. So. Um, once that works, once that is strong and stable and trustful, then everything may add to that. And very often, it's, there is an institution, which may be a school or a museum, uh, and or a client who may become the sponsor. If there is no institution, no client, then the architect himself may be, become the sponsor. Uh, that is more and more often the case, and I try to convince the architects by saying, relatively seen to the cost of a building and maybe also the earning of an architect, the cost of a book is minor, but the effect of a book is much, much more is major. And that, because that is also due to the fact that the trade doesn't pay back for the cost of the book. Anyway, once we got there, institution and sponsor, uh, 
somebody may turn into the process and look for an editor because um, at least books on an architect's work should not be edited by the architect himself. It should always be handed over um, trustfully to a person who knows and who is uh, not, um, how to say, who is strong enough to defend against the architect. Then you may look for authors who contribute to a book and there again they should be independent and strong-minded and uh, the photographer is very crucial because we talk, speak about visual books and there are very many uh, architecture photographers around and I think that also is a relationship between the architect and the photographer which once you find one, don't give up, really uh, develop, uh, teach, teach yourself, teach the photographer, find a way, find a signature for the, rep the photographic representation of your, of your work. And Ivan Bahn is, su is such a photographer who really gets uh, beaten up, I would say, by probably the most interesting architects today and I, uh, I insist uh, very frequently that he should uh, concentrate on his own uh, or also become an author besides being a servant. And the designer plays a role of course. In my case I enjoy very much being the publisher, the designer and sometimes the editor um, that keeps the the team small and we don't have to devise the expenses by too many heads, so food is better. Right. It goes on with the lithographer, the printer, that's the production part, which is in the responsibility of the publisher. And then of course it adds to the marketing, the trade, media, work, and finally the book should end up in the hands of the consumer. So I think it's a very crucial relationship and um, I really enjoy very much working with architects more than with artists I must say because they really develop very very quickly. It's very difficult after three years or five years time to uh, recall a, cer a certain uh, intensity of a work uh, while with architects they are used to think in a kind of a longer, longer period or slower written. Okay, back to the book. The, so the book as an object, the cover as its facade, and also to to bear in mind that the book is kind of a moving object. So you turn it around, and you may kind of surprise yourself by uh, any discovery. I try to relate the cover always to the content, like in this case the artist Felice Varini who does um, uh, these kind of uh, spatial paintings, uh, anamorphosen we would say, where you enter the, the space, you have a viewpoint where you have the full picture and then you enter the space and it explodes. Or I relate to typographic covers very much and uh, that's a pain for marketing because they would always love to have a picture on the cover. But some books make their life and gain a history also through the very simple fact that you may say I am dark, I have blue letters and that's why, that's what it is, and that's very meaningful. Like for Zumtor, we have a very dark, uh, dark book, very dense, very strict, where I thought you would hurt the book if you put uh, photographs, a picture on the cover. I like to work, as I said, into the into the paper, into the material. Um, 
and it may be more or less meaningful, but in this case, it is like walking through the snow and listening to your to your feet and your the sound. Snöheta, uh, it's a snow hat. Actually, is the translation of the name of this practice. You may know. Uh, so their book definitely had to be white and light. Another book, also white, not necessarily, but uh, I liked it that way, with an embossing, or probably the best known of this series is uh, Herzog Dömeron Natural History, which has a three-dimensional embossing again, and um, with the same difficulties, you have a depth of 0 0.3 millimeter into into the cardboard to make the three-dimensional uh, illusion. This is the cliché. Um, I, I remember there was a time when um, there was a book out by one of our designer colleagues with five or six different covers and it was it sounded kind of ridiculous because it really doesn't matter because you only buy one, right? Um, and as the bookbinder packs the book, the bookstore may also get only one type of the five. What we did with Freitag, if you, some of you may carry a Freitag bag and you know it's unique. Uh, every bag exists only once and we did the same with the book. So the spine of the book is made out of uh, leftovers from the back production, so every spine looks different. Really every, 10,000 copies. I like fabric covers, I must say. This is a broderie on the cover. The design is by Hela Jongerius, and we developed the technology actually together um, with the manufacturer. This is a Japanese silk with an embossing and it's a, very, it's a soft, soft cover. Very rarely there is image on the cover. Um, I may allow, but uh, it should be rare, exceptional, and meaningful. Like Buckminster Fuller, my all-time hero, uh, who I think gives us the slogan for for our analog awareness by thinking global and acting local. Uh, he said that in 1929. And uh, I think think global is the digital and act local is the analog. Very rarely I, I have friends who may convince me to publish their monograph, like Shigong Guir. Um, I show you the flat cover because the book is a little bit too fat. It's 680 pages, and I kind of suffered. I didn't get them down to less. Well, this one is more dense, and in these cases, I think also that color and typography may do the job. Um, we always have complaints with Amazon when they ask for pictures, at least they hate our white and sometimes pure black covers. They don't really show well on the, the screen. Um, but with color it may be all right. So I really insist on that and I think that the program has made a kind of a, an image for itself through this uh, limitation and maybe also insisting on the haptic and the tactile uh, quality of, of uh, the cover. This was our bestseller over the past years. I think that, uh, I don't know, I, I think I saw it upstairs in the library where it belongs. Um, those are collaborations with uh, the Harvard Graduate School of Design, um, which is an ongoing um, program actually we say all the lasting titles should go with Lars Miller publishers and all the short-term uh, publications may end up 
with other publishers, so that's a good solution for me, I must say. The history of the GSD, and again, it's just dealing with color and type and be convinced. Um, we also work with other designers, or sometimes we end up uh, taking on projects which are in the hands of other designers, and that is very attractive and interesting for me because it leads to a kind of more a supervisor uh, job, very very comfortable. You don't have, you know, you, you just you just talk, but you don't have to do the work. Um, those manifestos of the storefront for art and architecture in New York, it's a new series, and it's designed by designers at Pentagram, uh, Natasha Yen. This is uh, another book we celebrate here, being in Los Angeles. I'm, I'm super happy to to really have two new books out in one and, and present them in one week uh, here in, in Los Angeles. Those two, the Stephen Hall and LA10, uh, edit, edited by Stephen Phillips, who is also here and also happy to sign his book. Um, it is a collection of interviews with uh, 10 Los Angeles-based architects. Um, going back to the late 70s and 80s. Um, I think there will be a discussion next Tuesday about whether they form a group or not. Uh, that may not be essential, but for younger readers, it may be interesting to read and, and understand uh, where the, the power comes from, you know, when I think we always need a certain kind of competition and uh, a kind of a measure, uh, whether from a friend or from an enemy, but just to to uh, identify somebody that who is who is uh, pushing in the similar direction. And I think that book is is showing that there was a lot of lot of move and and uh, power in that generation back in the 70s and 80s. Um, that book will be launched officially next Tuesday at the Architecture and Design Museum. So if you can make it there, it's good. The book was fully on the control of um, Stephen Phillips. And we had a back and forth on some design matters, some micro items and especially the production of the book, but otherwise it's really a Gesamtkunstwerk of the editor. We always suffer a bit by the typesetting, you know, the unjustified, left unjustified uh, text where in German, it's very common that you, to, that you, you are allowed to make hyphens, hyphenations, right? And we just learned that that uh, in English you would sacrifice the beauty of your typography to not having hyphenations and maybe have a more an uh, an, an oral oral related uh, typography. But we try to do our best if we can. Um, another book which I think is important that we understand that books are probably the only reliable uh, container of memory. Um, that's something you may recognize when, as it happened to me a couple of days ago, when we discussed the reprint of Wolfgang Weingart's April will uh, know the book also to reprint Wolfgang's book, which was published 12 years ago, or no, 10 years ago. And the, da the data was saved and stored on jazz disks. You remember those? Kind of 
fat ones. I think there was a one, one gigabyte uh, memory. Uh, and we are still looking for a lithographer, probably, who may have a chest drive. Um, anyone here having a chest drive? I may send them over, and uh, we do. Anyway, um, I think, like in this case, that um, history deserves kind of a safe storage. And safe storage really happens in book form. Um, and in this case, for example, there was a, a reprint, re-edition of a very small, very, really 48-page uh, manifesto from 1977, which uh, two uh, architecture historians kind of discovered. No, they just worked on it and as a reinterpretation and a re. Uh, re-edition and we made it the book showing in facsimile the precious documents. This is a manuscript by Rem Kohlhaas which was with the red corrections of, of Ungers. Um, those are the two. It was really in the, in the 70s, in the early times of um, let's say, post-modernist post um, urbanist, urbanism out of uh, Cornell University and Ungers as a leading figure. Uh, back to Ivan Bahn, that's one of the results of our discussions about authorship. Um, and I think you can always do both. You can, you can have a kind of a service attitude in your profession if uh, you know what it's about, but you should always have another part. Uh, in, in German we say a Standbein, Spielbein, so one leg you stand on and one leg you play with, right? So dancers may know very well. Right? Um, so when Brasilia cele celebrated uh, 50 years in 2010, I got several offers to publish a book on Brasilia, and most of them were historic, so were kind of historic portfolios of the making of the building of Brasilia, and I refused all, but in discussion with uh, Ivan, uh, we thought that it could be interesting to revisit Brasilia and see how people live, how it has uh, developed and how it has grown uh, socially. Um, but I did not like the idea to celebrate Brasilia necessarily. Uh, anniversaries are kind of terrible in, in, in design and planning and history. So we added Chandigar, which is about the same generation, and the two cities built out of scratch and representing a Western, the Western idea of uh, modernism and, or imperialism, if you want. And so uh, Ivan traveled to the both cities, spent time there and watching the people uh, in, their, in their life and claiming authorship for this book. And I think that's, uh, and he seems to like it because since then there were several other projects um, uh, discussed, like also this one, Torre David. This is a High race building in uh, Caracas, where Ivan contributed as an author. I made him a co author uh, while the editors and authors of the book thought, no, no, he's kind of the serving photographer. But I think if 50% of the book is photography, then the author deserves to be seen as such. Um, I want to say that uh, I'm not necessarily or specifically an architecture publisher. Uh, if you watch my program or our website, it's, we have 
four or five categories. It's architecture, design, photography, art, and society. I would love to add science, actually, but, uh, uh, well, maybe something to come. In, in uh, design, graphic design, um, I, I try to get rid of this image of being Mr. Helvetica by using Helvetica, well, preferably, but, um, and after, after this one, uh, which was kind of a, Iron, uh, ironic uh, contribution to the discussion, I brought up, uh, brought a serious uh, story and history of the Helvetica typeface, which really is an icon of uh, modern design, and we are now working on a reprint of a magazine of that period, late 50s, early 60s, when Swiss graphic design was uh, internationally loved or hated, uh, but very influential. Uh, observations and collections, again, uh, visual uh, collections in book form, I think, are very important. Those are in this book, there are 1,500 signs for peace from all over the world, showing that there is a very strong desire for visual uh, representation of the desire and the search for, for peace. Um, I have a certain uh, or a great sympathy for Japan and some authors, some friends there, uh, which I love to present to the West. One is Kenya Hara, a very brave, wonderful uh, designer who is now working on his third book, and he promised a re-edition of this book, Design and Design, which has been out of stock for a while. White is a, a smaller book on the color white, Shiro in Japanese, which is the meaning not only for the color, but also for silence and emptiness. So it's a kind of a philosophical background of uh, Kenyahara's design. This red book is uh, by another Japanese designer who is a wonderful, excellent teacher. Um, and he is teaching a 12-week course to freshmen in graphic design where there is absolutely no computer or electronic device in the room. And it's all around and about the apple. And the course goes through all all possible techniques in observing the apple, but getting uh, familiar with design strategies, design thoughts, analysis, uh, experiments, and so on. kind of an encouragement for, for teachers and, and students alike. Sorry. Right. So, um, I'm getting closer to the end here. Uh, this is another uh, Japanese friend uh, author who uh, developed these digital um, images which which together with a, a transparent uh, a linear pattern and you move it and you get kind of a kinetic uh, sensation very beautiful very analog um, one thing you may imagine the, pub, the publisher suffered was the CD-ROM included into the book. That was a nightmare, actually. Uh, and it was a very, very short period, And uh, but somehow people insisted, yeah, there must be a CD-ROM in the back, 
containing all this additional material. Nobody knew what is on there, but it had to be, right? So, of course, as, a, as designers, we found, we, we found ways to, to include it, but it was really doing harm to the book. And what we know uh, today is that that really was a very uh, opportunistic move of the industry and I'm happy to say that we have overcome this and I will show you in a minute. Uh, this is a book on Corbusier as a photographer, um, which he was not recognized uh, of being, but he photographed in his early days and then after a break in the 30s, so those were some of his early cameras and he was traveling uh, in the in the early 20s or between I think 1912 and 15 and he took photographs all over on architecture and then in the 30s again he, he got the camera which was a Siemens B16 which was a film camera it, which was able to take f still photographs as, at the same time very easily so exactly what we do with our smartphones, you know, to take short video clips and photograph and combine. Um, so he had this camera, but he refused to photograph architecture in the meantime. Um, but he photographed his family, his wife, uh, and, and on travels he photographed people and objects uh, as you like. Flew to Bras uh, Brasilia uh, with uh, this airship. So, so what we did with the agreement of the Corbusier Foundation in Paris, we included seven short films of Corbusier in the book by offering you this QR code. Of course, by now, or most people may scan them or photograph them with their with their smartphones, which is not a very pleasant uh, size. Maybe the iPad uh, can do, but uh, I was told that in very short time, personal computers or computers, even home computers, will be will be equipped with with scanners of what sort sort ever. So what we did here, we now. We said I would escape and then push here. Yeah. So that easy you get you get to see seven short five to seven minutes uh Corbusier films. He was not really a filmmaker, so uh but it's interesting to see the fascination of, of having a camera and uh, being able to kind of cut while you, and edit while you, while you film. So being a lo bit long here, I may interrupt this and get to the end. to the very end, which uh, I said it is um, like how I try to behave as a publisher, as a designer, but also as a, as a political being. I think it's, uh, it's important in our professions that we, that we don't keep our opinions and beliefs too private. You know, I think we have kind of public positions, we have a kind of a social responsibility, so I think we should raise our voice and be uh, strong about our beliefs and include them in our 
uh, our work. So what I tried, let's say, later in my career than sooner, was to transform and transfer my experience, my knowledge as a designer, as a publisher, into a field which was not necessarily uh, that close, that closed uh, community of, uh, of professionals or designers and architects, but the more broader uh, audience, but still communicate with vis visual uh, 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 content. And uh, that was the first of a series of what I call a visual reader, where the content is uh, more than 50% visual and allows kind of uh, reading of images and maybe then referring back to, to texts um, uh, as you like. So after the human rights, or kind of the most recent one was this one, Democracy, um, and the books contain between 300 and 500 images, kind of telling the state of the art in a democracy, and you can imagine, well, or I, I mean the book to be an instrument while it's new uh, and released, but becoming a document short after. Uh, so in five or 10 years time, you may uh, measure the development of democracy or you know how worse it will get with the climate. Um, I think here Shanine mixed up with the slide. Anyway, no. So that's out of. Uh, yeah, I, I know how it came. Um, in I wasn't. I came from San Francisco to to um, Los Angeles, and in discussion with a friend there. We passed the question, uh, which also was kind of analog, digital, and he said, if we remove the homeless from the streets, we delete them from our brains or from, from our memory. So that was for me, and then I referred to the book on human rights, it became this kind of pretty true, you know, what, is, what does not exist visually and is accessible does easily not exist uh, in our brains at, as well. There was another book I initiated um, on, on water, the phenomenon of water, but also the politi political implications of water. And it came to my mind when I realized how we ship uh, mineral water around the world in all directions, right? So you may get this Swiss Heideland water from the Alps uh, in fancy Los Angeles bars and restaurants, while in Zurich we drink Fiji water. And that's such a nonsense, that, but it becomes a metaphorical value, in fact, you know, for how stupid uh, people can act just to make a business. Um, well, as we know that life depends on water, I think uh, that source should be owned by all or nobody. Thank you very much.